Now before we start, can I ask, has anyone heard of React Pipe before? Okay, is anyone using React Pipe to do your own development work that's separate to say the usage of React that you might have in your cluster? No, perfect, okay. Because this talk is really meant to let you all know as Erlang developers that there is some tooling out there to let you do distributed data processing work on a Dynamo-based system um, for, for scalable distribution of pipelining work, basically. Um, so you could argue that we're, we're structurally different to what's uh, achievable with Storm, if you know of the Storm data processing uh, platform. Um, Twitter used Storm quite extensively, uh, but uh, it's possible to achieve exactly the same results in a, in a fault-tolerant way um, using React Pipe. Now, first of all, who am I? Um, I'm part of Basho EMEA, so I'm part of our London office, uh, which is basically about nine to ten months old now. Um, so we're still in the phase of really establishing ourselves in Europe, but uh, the team is growing all the time, and I'm one of the client services engineers. So let's go. Okay, now my first question was who's using React Pipe? Now my second question is who's using React Core? Does anyone know React Core? Okay. Um, so. React Pipe is an abstraction layer on top of React Core, and I hope that I might need to go through React Core. So the first one third of this presentation is going through React Core in a little bit of detail to let you know exactly how we structure our Dynamo implementation. Um, it's an abstraction layer that instead of vNodes, which is the uh, level of abstraction you have access to in React Core, it's a higher level abstraction that allows you to create stages and pipelines and fittings which allow you to basically run a sequence of processing functions on inputs and send those outputs to other processing functions across your cluster. So that, that is React Pipe in a nutshell. Um, it's not developed by me, it's developed by someone much, much cleverer than me, uh, Brian Fink. You can find him on Twitter as hobbyist. He's one of our senior engineers and works on a lot of the cool stuff that's in React. Um, in fact, all of this work with React Core, React Pipe, KV, because they're all pieces of React, they're all separate Erlang applications that you can integrate into your own stack and do your own data processing work or your own storage work. Um, and it's all on GitHub, so go in and download it and, and build it. So what's React Core? Um, at a high level description, it's a toolkit for building distributed systems. Okay, um, it's a, it's the lowest level of um, abstraction on a Dynamo system available to you that is in the Erlang community today. Um, and it's, used as a foundation for a whole bunch of other subsystems. If you remember the architectural picture that, that Stuart showed you just previously, that, that pieces of React um, as a database engine, our KV storage uh, application and the React search functionality all sit and communicate directly through React Core into, into the vNodes. Um, and it provides this idea of virtual nodes. Virtual nodes are an abstraction mechanism on physical nodes that allow you to uh, divide up a, um, a key space, some sort of hash, hash space of some kind that you can um, allow vNodes to be distributed, a number of vNodes on a single physical node, which means that when you add new physical nodes, instead of handing off uh, instead of dividing data partitions from existing physical nodes, you're handing off these virtual nodes and saying, I don't want, I'm not going to look after these, the, whatever these v, v nodes are managing, these worker nodes are managing, I'm going to let this new physical node do that. So it's a way of minimizing data reshuffling, um, but distributing whatever your hash space problem is, whether it's in React terms, some sort of storage problem, or in data processing terms, a number of, wor of uh, worker processes you want to make available across your cluster to actually do transformation work on data. By the way, please feel free to jump in at any point and just ask any questions that, that come up. Um, that code, as I said before, it's up online uh, on, on Basho's GitHub account. Now, if you 
want to be able to pull out React Core, play with it, build your own applications, and you don't want to look through the React code base itself, then there is a separate application called Basho Banjo, which is an example application that takes a MIDI file, an audio file, and, and asks different nodes um, distributed on a cluster using React Core to write that information to, to audio syncs that might be attached to those different servers. So you can play music from different servers, basically. Um, now, without scaring everyone with what, what's involved with React Core, uh, this gives you an <laughs> internals idea. I'm going to make these slides available at the end, but this is all of the um, underlying mm, architectural foundation that goes into React Core that we expose to you to be able to control this Dynamo system, distributed system. Um, like I said, if you, if you just want to work at a high level abstraction, this is where React Pipe comes into play, but you can always drop down to a lower level and talk directly to vNodes to, to uh, grab hold of that compute power or that storage space or that memory space. So I keep talking about a Dynamo system. React Core implements what you need to be a Dynamo-based database engine. Um, now, a Dynamo system, it, d I think um, Stuart's already asked this question, but um, you, some of you will have heard of Dynamo before. It's based on research work by Amazon that was put together around 2007. Um, and it's this idea that, that you want to build a system that allows you to consistently spread, so allow you to take something, this hash space um, of information, uh, and I'll show you a diagram that gives more detail into this uh, later on, but take this hash space and then allow you to consistently access particular vNodes that are on physical nodes across that cluster. And it's a way of coordinating that work. Um, so data distribution, consistent hashing, tunable replication management, so this concept of fault tolerance is built into React relies on this n value of three, these three replicas being stored on v nodes that are on physically distinct nodes. Um, all of this is powered by that, that level of abstraction. Based on Amazon's Dynamo research work, and the purpose of their design at the end of the day was low latency and high availability. Okay, so they were, they were willing in their, in the example that they give in their research papers, the shopping cart example, okay, they did, they did some research work and they determined that they were, there was lost revenue uh, because it was taking too long for customers to go through the purchasing stages of building their shopping cart and actually purchasing um, and paying and going through payment gateways and everything else. That process was taking too long. It was the, the latency times were too high and people would come back to it later, never come back to it and never finish the purchase and they were losing revenue. So they, they realized that the only way they could uh, increase revenue with their existing customer base was by lowering the latency time to build your, your shopping carts and, and go through your purchasing um, habits and, and, and buy whatever you want. So that's why low latency is at the heart of, of a Dynamo system as is high availability because if, you know, at the end of the day, a node, a physical server that goes down is just extremely high latency, right? Just to, as long as that server is down, it's never going to be able to respond to any requests and then it comes back up again and then that's the, the length of time it took to start receiving requests again. So a little bit more about consistent hashing. Now remember, all of this is part of React Core. I'm explaining this as a precursor to why you want to use React Pipe to do your data processing work on top of a Dynamo system. Um, it's a hashing technique that allows you to do minimal amount of reshuffling of, of data, of information stored on that ring state. Um, tolerant to divergent client views and coordinates both replicas selection and replication. So all of this, what we call tunable consistency, um, what you know in a, in, a, in a SQL database of some kind, so Oracle, MySQL, um, Postgres, all of those engines are ASIC compliant. They've all got query engines that enforce um, um, ASIC compliancy by introducing locking mechanisms during that write process or that update process to coordinate a sequence of events before that is then flushed to disk in some way. Um, with, with a Dynamo system, you can enforce certain copies of your uh, data, certain replicas, to re 
um, be required to respond to confirm that that data was written and that gives you a much more fine-grained control over whether you're willing to accept slightly higher latency for a request to guarantee that your primary replica nodes have actually got that data and stored it or whether you're willing to sacrifice and become slightly more eventually consistent so accepting network topology and asynchronous transfer for latencies instead to get that lower latency so it's a trade-off you get to choose when when you work with a dynamo system so this is just a, a diagrammatic representation. So we use 160-bit integer key space. We divide that up into a fixed number of partitions. Um, those, the number of partitions are defined at the start of the creation of that cluster. So you start by defining 128 or 64 or 256, 512, however many you need based on the... the cluster topology that you've got and normally we help customers and open source users determine whether they want to be using a smaller number of data partitions or a larger number of data partitions um, so these partitions are claimed by physical nodes in this case these four nodes are all um, working together to store a subset of the key space an overlapping subset of the, of the key space um, to give you that fault tolerance Replicas go to the end uh, partitions following the key. So I, I run my, my consistent hash over my key and it is then located somewhere on the ring on three distinct nodes. And that's by default your end value of three. Uh, cluster membership, again, this is all part of React Core already built for you. Um, everything to do with process monitoring, um, to do with calculating fallback nodes uh, and... Um, basically administrative work for bringing in new physical nodes that will then take ownership of virtual nodes. Ring management, so gossiping ring state, so what one node knows about another node knows about another node in that in that peer-to-peer -peer based system that makes up a, a dynamo system. Um, and finally handoff, so this handoff management is a, I like to use a small analogy for this. So if I've got an n value of three, I store three replicas of my data. Okay, those, those replicas will be stored on V nodes that we call primary re replica managers. Okay, so if one of those primary replicas goes down, so a physical server goes down, then what happens is the next time that piece of information is written, three copies are then pushed into the, the cluster, but one of the nodes can't accept that, so it's written to what we call a fallback node. And that fallback node is like your neighbor who's next door picking up your mail, and it'll hold on to that mail long enough for you to come back from holiday, and when you're back, it'll hand over that mail again. And all of this is managed for you by React Core. So now that we've covered React Core in more detail in basically what a Dynamo system is, how we've implemented it, and what, what kind of level of control you have over the system, um, let's talk a bit more about React Pipe. Um, the key concepts are as follows. Unfortunately, Pipe itself, um, because it was based around the word pipelining, you've got this concept of pipes and fittings. It, it's a, a bit of an analogy around the, the idea of building a pipeline and uh, so the, the terminology is a bit bit interesting at times so the idea is that you have a pipeline and that pipeline contains fittings okay these fittings are functions they're Erlang functions that run inside a worker process okay each of those fittings has to follow a particular behavior and react pipe itself makes certain behaviors available to allow you to do certain typical data processing work um, and then the partitioner itself decides which V nodes, again, this is where the Dynamo ring comes back into play, which V node will be handling the processing work that that fitting is going to be performing. Okay? Now, what does that look like in, real wo in the real world, I guess? Um, from a diagrammatic perspective, you've got what Core does. You know, you want to access the ring, you give it a key, it'll hash the key, it'll find it on, the, on find a replica, or depending on your end value and your, your uh, Curum value, it'll respond to you with a number of replicas um, and give you your data back out. That's how Core works. Now, how would Pipe work? Well, this is, this is Pipe's abstraction on top of Core. So you might ask for a piece of data, that data get 
gets passed into a fitting, that fitting runs on that V node, performs that transformation work, you might take that output and pass it to a new fitting to do some other transformation work. You might converge all fittings together into one V node to basically aggregate some result set of some kind, and then eventually you can respond back out. Okay, so it's this approach where you can take advantage of these V nodes to distribute workload and processing work and, uh, and collect results and return results in a, in a highly parallel fashion. Is rings and core the same thing? Um, yes, a co React Core is the name of the, the Erlang application we built that actually represents a dynamo ring. Yeah, okay, so um, core is our implementation of, of Dynamo. Okay, so let's take an example, right? Let's bring it to something a little bit more high level and something we can discuss in, in more detail. So some sort of pipelining process that I might want to perform. I might want to render some HTML markup based on some comment that I, I want to fetch from my database or wherever. So I fetch that and I get back my JSON record. So this, is all, this would be done in one fitting. And then once that fitting is done, the output of that fitting, the job that it performed, was to give, provide this output. And then that output itself might be sent along to another pipe, another fitting process. And that fitting process will actually then convert that JSON into HTML and then pass the output put right back out of the pipeline or pass it on to another stage of the pipeline which might construct your HTML um, system uh, template. So how does that actually look in terms of Erlang code? Well, it's quite straightforward to break it down into three pieces. Okay, so piece number one is this piece. Um, what I'm doing is I'm saying I want to create two fittings. Okay, I'm going to tell you which module the, the uh, function exists that I want to execute for that fitting, for that transformation logic that I want to perform, and I'm going to name that for, for uh, logging and, and debugging purposes, and uh, if I want, I'll pass some custom arguments over uh, to that fitting as well. Um, this is your bootstrapping, your, your setup for your pipeline. Yeah? Are you restricted to data that's in React, or are you allowed to do external calls for data, or anything else? Um, sorry, can you say that again? Uh, are you restricted in this code to operate inside of the React pipe, or can you make like external calls? No, you can you can you can make any Erlang call you like in that function. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could do any kind of data processing work. You could farm it out to another um, external application and then wait for it to respond back to you. Yeah, most definitely. Um, then what I'm doing is I'm sending three comments. I'm sending three pieces of information into the, into the pipeline. Okay? And so those are going to be sent down the pipe and then dealt with during those intermediate uh, fitting stages. And finally, I collect the results back up. I get the, the comments that were rendered from the pipeline and uh, do with them what I like, basically. Um, and uh, that's where the processing function itself is defined. And again, there are a bunch of pre-built behaviors that allow you to um, basically bootstrap and do initialization and, and completion logic around the, the particular fitting function you want to perform. Um, and this is optional. You don't have to tear down the pipe itself. You could reuse the pipe many, many times. Um, just an example that you can optionally tear down the pipe and say, send, send that EOF, uh, EOI marker when I'm, com when I'm done with that logic. Um, so this is what an actual fitting looks like. The really only important bit here is this process function. Um, this is my um, gathering of the function that I want to execute from my module. I'm running it on my input. I'm getting my results, and I'm sending my results onward. Um, and that, that really is, at essence, what your functions would look like, your fittings would look like as part of your pipelining process. So you basically, you've got these building blocks where you say, I want to do A, B, C, D, E, different things. They're all going to be separate uh, fittings in my pipeline. At the very start, I create a, an, uh, a pipeline itself, and I create a number of pipes and pass in inputs that will be transformed, sent onwards, or eventually returned out the, out the pipe. Um, 
the real key to taking advantage of React Pipe um, is that close connectivity it has to the Dynamo ring. Okay? Remember, because you have this consistent hash function which determines which virtual node that operation, that fitting, is going to be run on top of, you have the power to do things like take my output from, you know, run this on every V node I have available, but then send all of the outputs from that to a single V node that's going to do some final workload on that. And it's that control process of Partic uh, by constructing a hash function that then c points to the same V node um, will allow you to, to gather results and basically do m more data processing work than MapReduce, but MapReduce is essentially um, the reason we built React Pipe to begin with and is a, a perfect example of where uh, React Pipe takes advantage of this distributed processing logic. Um, yeah, the hash function, I've already said this, funnels inputs to a vNode. And follow is a hash function that we've already defined for you, which allows you to aggregate those results. So again, it's that second fitting that you can say, run the, the consistent hash function called follow, which will mean that you'll aggregate all results. You'll send all the inputs from the first fitting into that second fitting on a single vNode. So, it's this, it, it gives you the power to do these sorts of things. So you start off very simply, okay? I'm basically going to take advantage of every single V node and run some function on all of the V nodes. And finally, I'm going to reduce that work down on a single V node. Um, very easy, very simple. But now what I can do instead is I can do something called pre-reduce, which was not possible in a previous version of um, React's MapReduce implementation, which is now possible by taking advantage of React Pipe the way it does. So you can map, so you can gather information from all of the vNodes. You can then reduce um, all of the work on the vNodes that are data local to a physical node, reduce them down on there, and then aggregate them together. So you're not shuffling, you're not moving as much data across the network to do the processing work. Again, it's this, like, I might end up having, depending on my number of vNodes and, and number of worker processes maintained, I could have millions of messages traveling all over the network trying to respond and run these fitting functions um, over, over whatever pipeline I want to, to do workload on. But taking advantage of these pre-reduced stages where you can take a hash function that says, actually, send, gather all of the, the, the information from the V nodes that are on this physical node and just send them all to a V node on that node. They're not having to do any network transfer. Reduce, pre-reduce of some kind, and then, and then push it onwards. Um, so you reduce that to effectively the, the final reduce phase is no more than the number of V nodes you have available in, in that cluster. Now, all of this is based on some uh, research work uh, by Eric Brewer and, and other members in the distributed systems community. Um, and it's based on this staged event-driven design architecture. Um, event queues are managed by the pipes. Um, this is something I'll talk about is how we've implemented that in React Pipe in a second. But essentially, queues are attached to every vNode, which allows you to apply some sort of pressure if some sort of compute task is taking longer on one particular fitting in that, in that pipeline than the, than the rest. You can essentially have some sort of control over the amount of back pressure that's across that entire system. Um, it helps to keep the memory footprint under control and queues can be size capped to limit the backlog. Uh, the research paper is at this link, and like I said, I'll make the slides available, so please do read that paper. It's a very interesting paper, and it, it basically explains a lot of what were the design decisions behind Pipe. Um, and so in React Pipe, each V node manages a queue. So what does that look like? So now we've zoomed in to a particular V node, and there's a series of queues, and the V node itself has a, has a worker pool. Um, and each of those worker pools pulls from one of the queues to perform that fitting function that you, you want to, that transformation work you want to perform. Um, where does this all fit in in the real world? This is really nice. It's very abstract at this stage. I've mentioned a few times that, that uh, we use it in React. So let me 
um, just go into a little bit more about, I won't go through this, you've already heard more than enough about what makes React different to other database engines. Um, but what, how we use React Pipe at the moment, and it's something that we are trying to push throughout the entire infrastructure that we've got. In fact, we're planning even potentially to replace KV directly with a, with a React Pipe uh, application. So what MapReduce is fundamentally is Typically, before MapReduce, you'd run a SQL query, you'd gather your results, the results would be sent into your application layer, and your application layer would do some sort of transformation work, aggregation work, and then push that information back into the database again. Now, this was fine when we had hundreds of gigabytes of data. Now that we have uh, hundreds of petabytes of data, it's not possible to move, it's too costly in both latency and bandwidth to move all of that information into your application layer. Not to, you know, not, not even to forget that it's highly likely that the application layer itself doesn't have capacity to take in all of that information, to do the processing work itself. There's just too much information there. So instead of pulling data out, transforming it and pushing it back, the, the focus of MapReduce is to push the, push the function you want to perform onto your database engine and say, you run it locally on what information you have for that subset of your data. Okay, so this is what we do. We move the data processing work to the data itself in React. Scales more efficiently and takes advantage of compute power on database servers at scale. So for more involved queries, our specific implementation at this stage allows you to specify input keys. You can process data using map and reduce functions which are fittings in React Pipe. And you can, at the moment, do it in both JavaScript or Erlang, but you guys are all going to be writing Erlang, so we're OK. <laughs> um, you can actually have a look at the MapReduce implementation, the pipe itself, um, in, in uh, React KV. And again, this is something we just want to replace KV entirely with, with this implementation, rather than hooking them together. Um, but uh, at this stage, it's still as an embedded piece of, of KV. So a MapReduce example, I'm sorry I didn't write it in Erlang. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it just wanted to give you a really, really rough example. So this is the string that is my, my reduce function. Okay, um, and I've got the map, the query I want to perform, and in this case what it's doing is sending me back the key and the number of it, uh, counts for the word pizza that was found in whatever the value object in that KV pair is. So this is done by passing that string into the JavaScript engine, which does the whole lexical analysis parsing and, and building that AST representation that, that Erlang can then read, um, and, and returning a result set of some kind. So again, this is a, a high-level overview of how pipe is used in React. You can farm out, you can run fittings functions over your data at the, at the location of the data itself, and then aggregate results for, for some sort of business advantage or, or, or um, collection process, analytics process of some kind. Um, Sidestepped a little bit into React Cloud Storage. Um, I'm not going to go into the S3 offering. Stuart's already covered that. But I want to show you an example of how Pipe is used there and our MapReduce implementation is used to do some fitting work to, to aggregate information. Um, so basically, our Cloud Storage product is a thick proxy that sits on top of a React cluster and breaks down those data blocks into one meg chunks that are then stored to the cluster. So how, how does CS use React Pipe? Well, um, because it's a multi-tenant product, uh, we need a way of calculating the amount of, of data that a user is storing in their um, S3 objects space and allows us to bill them appropriately or, or then when they're running it, customers are running it locally to build their own internal customers in some way. Um, because again, this is something that is set up on a private cloud or EC2 if you want to run your own CS cloud over EC2. Um, 
So the map function itself looks through all the files that belongs to a user and emits tuples, um, which is basically the file ID and the size of that file, and it, some sort of integer representation of the size of that file. The reduce function sums up all the file sizes together, and you end up knowing basically how much data a particular user is using in that cluster. And the pre-reduce function allows us to sum up. So taking advantage of Re React Pipe, we can now pre-reduce um, that information and do it data locally so that the number of messages that are aggregated in the final reduce phase is basically the number of V nodes in your, in your cluster. Um, current users of React Pipe. I'd love to say that all of you guys will become React Pipe users after this talk. Um, at the moment, Basho obviously uses React Pipe. <laughs> um, some great discussions on the mailing list. Um, some open source users, maybe. It's hard to know because you just need to download the code. Um, so you add it as your dependencies in rebar and grab it and pull it in and, and you're good to go and we never know whether you're actually making use of it or not. So we did have discussed with different customers of ours who actually wanted to take advantage of Pipe itself in their React cluster and communicate directly to that to do some advanced uh, analytics work. Um, we're not sure whether they're actually doing that at this stage or not. It's hard to keep track of what developers are working on. Um, because there's no visible interface um, at React's abstraction level, Pipe is not getting utilized as effectively and efficiently as it should be, and it could be. Um, and this is something that's on our future work that we're trying to improve. Um, Ultimately, current users, I don't really know, other than Basho. So I can tell you it's extremely stable, though, which is um, great because we've basically battle-tested it in, you know, 100 uh, node clusters and, and larger. So we, uh, we know that it works at scale. Um, now, uh, someone asked me this at lunch, actually. Um, Storm is another distributed data processing environment, a platform. Uh, I know that Twitter uses it, and it's, it's gaining a lot of popularity at the moment. And again, it, these kind of platforms are not designed to compete with Hadoop. They're not for your deep analytics work. They're not for your 24 hours, extremely complex functions and queries that you want to run and then derive large reports that can be sent as bills to your customers or whatever. Um, it's designed for kind of real-time data processing work. So how, what's the difference between the two? Well, in React Pipe, we describe it as a pipe and a fitting. We have a Dynamo-based implementation. We do something called at most once processing. So um, when a fitting is used to um, run some sort of computation work over a, an input, that fitting isn't then used again in that pipeline. You can create another copy of that fitting and chain them together, but the fitting itself, you can't, re, you can't send the output easily directly back to the same fitting again. Um, so it's what we call at most once processing. Um, there's no such thing as branching. So anyone who's more familiar with the details of Storm, Storm allows you to do branching work where different pipelines can converge and diverge and break off into other processing work. There's no way to do that in React Pipe at this stage. Um, Storm uses the terminology sprout, uh, spouts and bolts. Um, it's tiered master wor uh, worker nodes and relies on Zookeeper. So there is a master-slave architecture there, which means that you don't get the fault tolerance that you'll get from a Dynamo-based system. Um, at least once processing, so one fitting is able to run its input work and produce an output that can then be sent back to the same fitting or the same bolt in, in storm terms. Future work. Well, we're always doing performance improvement work. The larger you make this, these, these clusters and the, the further you push uh, React and the kind of large-scale installations we have um, at the moment, you find edge cases in any distributed systems. As Erlang engineers, you guys know it well. When things are moved into scale, there's a, a, a compounded level of complexity when debugging edge case problems. So we're always finding performance improvements that we can put into to pipe. 
Um, but don't worry, we, we do that work for you because it all goes into React anyway. So any pipe users can happily take advantage of performance improvements as we find them and make them. Um, other language fittings, it's something I mentioned earlier on. There's no external interface to pipe at this stage. So you can either treat it as something you access via MapReduce in React, or if you want to dig lower, you can pull it out and access it directly via Erlang. But if you want to access it via Lua or JavaScript or uh, Java for doing much more comprehensive work where you don't have to sit and, dis and talk directly to React's MapReduce, and you want to run your own custom functions with a much more um, close-knit level of control, that's, we've not yet exposed the ability for other programming languages to do that. What we expect that will eventually happen is that uh, the Vinos themselves will expose a... So you'd still, at the moment, you'd still have to define pipelines in Erlang, but the Vinos themselves would expose a TCP uh, port connection that would allow an external device to connect to it, pass in um, fitting functions that conform to some specification, and then could get run um, and run through the Erlang, Erlang VM. That's, that's some of the plans that are on the cards at the moment. Um, and again, like I said, the external interface itself would let you stop and start pipes, would let you throw inputs into pipelines and collect outputs by almost but almost like standard in, standard out, effectively. You could pipe stuff directly into your React, well, your, uh, React pipe cluster and do, do that transformation work. Um, more resources on, on React pipe. The GitHub code itself is, is up online and open source. The README has a lot of detailed implementation notes. So if we really want to know exactly what is going on here and how it connects directly to React core, you can find out a lot more there. Basho didgeridoo. Now, I mentioned to you Basho um, um, Banjo. Thank you. Basho Banjo is the React Core example application for playing a MIDI file uh, in a cluster just to experiment with building a, a React Core based system. Um, the didgeridoo is a rewrite of that that runs through React Pipe. So it's still going through Core, but it's going via Pipe. Um, this, all this work is summarized really nicely in a uh, research paper written by Brian Fink, and the PDF link to it is there, and again, I'll distribute these notes, and it should all be accessible and clickable. Um, any, you know, as with any open source code, there's always a mailing list, there's GitHub issues, and you can, of course, tweet um, Brian, and, and he's more than happy to talk things through about React Pipe. Um, I'm not sure I need to go through this slide, any further, but who we are in general, um, we're a bunch of ex-Akamai engineers founded in 2008. We build large-scale distributed systems. Um, React is our main product at the moment, and with that comes a whole bunch of Erlang applications that, that are stacked together to build a React cluster, um, and we specialize in storing critical information at scale. Uh, offices in the US, Europe, and Japan. Now, other libraries, as Erlang engineers, this is just a side plug into other tools and technologies that you might find useful. Uh, like I said before, React Core, build your own Dynamo systems. Lager, and I think I heard uh, the sum up guys are using Lager to, as their logging framework. Um, that's got a lot of endpoints. You can basically route your logging information into wherever you like. Um, as well as a lot of flexibility with storing on disk. Um, Web Machine is our REST-based HTTP server. And we've got many other projects. Again, they're all up on GitHub. So feel free to check them out. We, like, we, we enjoy basically being some of the, the larger um, companies that are really heavily contributing to the Erlang ecosystem. Um, we also do a lot of interesting work surrounding the VM and, and tuning that and, and doing performance improvements directly to the Erlang Beam VM. Um, now finally, where am I from? I'm from Basho EMEA. Um, this is our London office. It's quite a small, cozy office, but it's uh, got a good, good team of people, so feel free to drop us an email. And we're on London time, so we're an hour different from you guys, but uh, much better than waiting for the US guys to wake up. <laughs> um, anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, if I understood you correctly, you, you're using pipes internally for MapReduce. Yes. But I could also use it uh, to push my own events into it. 
Um, they would go from fitting to fitting, and I could access a different data set from here. Um, if, you write, if you write it in Erlang, inside um, the same VM, well, even across VM implementations, um, yes, you can. But we don't expose an external interface for other languages yet. So it's basically a, a framework to distribute my functions on the ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That basically. do not um, give me any kind of, let's say, transactions so I can be sure that my uh, data set prevents through all the types. Well, we, yeah, we, we, well, actually, okay, so one of the reasons that we are at most once is that it's possible for a fitting to tear down the pipe. You can, that fitting can forcibly say, I don't know what to do with this output anymore, I'm going to kill this pipe, which means that pipeline could die before reaching completion. And this is not something that happens in Storm. Storm is at, at, at least once, which means that you will eventually reach the end of that, that, uh, uh, sp spout and bolt chain. Um, but the bolts don't necessarily mean that at the end the output that you get is what you're going to want. Um, so, because again, it, you will have maybe suffered some error condition some way through that, that pipelining process. But yeah, you can, you can, because of the way you compose pipes, uh, fittings in your pipe, you can ensure that this will always, input will always be run first on here before the next. So you can impose a, a, um, uh, logical ordering of events. Um, I don't know whether you'd consider that transactionally compliant enough. Exactly yeah, once would be wrong with that. But, um, and what once is okay. Um, is there any kind of wrong? <laughs> not yet. No. It's on the cards, but it's not in, in there yet. Um, it's a bit hard to implement on a Dynamo system. <laughs> so, um, now, if anyone wants to know anything more, I, I think you've already seen this link from Stuart, but please feel free to, to drop us a, a note, get in touch with us, and we're happy to talk more about React. Yeah? From the data space perspective, yep. the concept of write once with many, because as I understood from the two presentations, I don't see any atomic operations on the data. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, we, no we don't. We don't have any transaction system inside React. That's by design. Because the implementation of a transaction system introduces some sort of right coordination. And that right coordination either introduces extreme latencies that don't fit the use case that a Dynamo system fits, or introduces a single point of failure of some kind. Uh, and that's again something that we don't want to accept in, in React. Yeah. Um, is it possible to tune the concurrency? Because, for instance, in a system like Storm, uh, one of the major selling points is actually that you can measure and tune concurrency, or measure latency and tune concurrency accordingly. Meaning that if there is some type of a worker that is taking longer than the other ones, you can just on more these worker types. Uh, is there something automatical in uh, uh, pipes, or how do you handle that? Yeah, that's um, not a problem. Nothing that's exposed yet, and even in Erlang terms, you'd have to dig through the guts of the system to be able to do that and, and derive information about which fittings are taking too long to perform their operations. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I want to return to the first question a little bit. Could you use this framework to do some kind of streaming process? Yeah. That would mean, like, when you, if something in your database updates, it automatically kicks off processing again. Yes. 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 Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, is it possible to run uh, homemade React core nodes in parallel to pipeline nodes? Uh, you mean running pipes is on a separate Erlang VM? No, it's the same VM, just not messing up each other. Uh, what do you mean by messing up each other? <laughs> I, I did some research and, for example, it was not possible to have two rings in one Erlang VM, or at least highly discouraged. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I see, you mean, you, I think you, we talked yesterday, so you have a React Core application already, so what you're thinking of doing is running on the same VM, a separate pipe um, application that has its own Dynamo ring. Stuff, but not for everything I do, so I wouldn't want to run everything on pipe, yeah. some stuff on pipe, and some stuff on my own coded nodes. Yeah, that, that's going to be tricky, it's definitely possible, but we, we definitely need to talk about it, basically, okay. offline it from here. Okay, I think that's, that's everything. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>